Glory to God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Well, we welcome everybody that's joining us by Facebook Live. Thank you for being with us today. There's no distance in prayer, and yet, as you can, be out here with us, because there are some things that happen here that you can't get there, but we're glad that you're with us today. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. You know, last week, we started talking about unstuck. Unstuck. As I just said, we, we pivoted, because as leaders, as the leaders of your church, we saw... Uh, we woke up to some things and we saw some things and we need to lead you into some things about prayer and power to move forward. And Joy did such a great job uh, talking about my driving last week. Bless her darling heart. I learned everything I know from her. No, no, not really. Uh, Although, uh, well, we won't go there because if I say anything about her driving now, you're going to think I'm just getting even. And uh, so we won't go there. But uh, I tell you, we did find some power in our car that we did not know it had, and it was a delight. (laughs) Hallelujah. It was a joy. Now, we have power. The point is, we have power as Christians that we're not taking advantage of. And that power is prayer. We need to be aware of it, and we need to take advantage of it. And one of the greatest powers we have as Christians is the power of prayer. And prayer in its simplest definition is talking with God. I'm going to take just a few moments here and review and because we're going to build on this this morning. At its simplest definition, prayer is talking with God. And the, and the point with God, not to God, is significant because prayer is a two-way conversation. It's not just a monologue. Prayer is not a disconnected, scripted monologue where we speak flowerier words out of duty and repetition, hoping that God will somehow notice, was the statement last week. It's not a duty on a checklist. And I'm thinking of back when 9-11 happened, back in 2001, that was my first day as the president of the Dubuque Ministerial Association. And as we got to our luncheon that day, All of us were in shock. We'd seen some of the videos on TV about the towers coming down. We were in shock. And we got together that day, and over the course of the next few days, we planned a prayer service. We brought the community together over St. Joseph's Catholic Church, St. Joseph the Worker over here. And we had a joint prayer meeting. It was a beautiful thing as people from all over the community came to pray. But I remember as we got together to plan that service, one of the Catholic priests that was involved made this statement talking about his congregation. He said, I'm afraid that that our people, I'm afraid that our people are saying prayers, but not praying. I'm talking about prayer not being a scripted thing, not being a duty thing, not being a repetition thing. Okay, Jesus said they think the people will think they're being heard for their much speaking, but your father already knows what things you have need of before you ask him. And yet he said to pray because we have authority on this earth. And as we pray to our Father who is in heaven, he grants us those things here on earth. Can I get an amen? Amen. Now, prayer is the power source for our life as Christians. It's not just some Christians, not just the prayer people, okay? Not just the prayer group, not just some kind of super saints. Let's get that. The prayer is talking with our Heavenly Father, the very best dad that could ever be. And some of us, some of us, frankly, have not had a good relationship with our earthly father. And so when that statement is made, it's talking with our dad. We have a hard time relating with that. We need to come to the word of God and we need to come into fellowship with other believers that have come to know him so that we can get an accurate picture of who our heavenly father really is. And let that refresh our image and our thinking, our imagination of what a dad looks like. Amen. Amen. One of my sons says, I'm the best dad that's ever been. But frankly, I look at my boys and my son-in-law, and I think, man, they're better than I ever was. I'm so proud of them. Because they're letting God, they're that way because they've let God in their life. And and he changes things. Can I get an amen from somebody that knows him? Amen. Now listen, if you don't know God as your heavenly father, you can before the service is over. I'm going to give you an opportunity. Now... Prayer is the amazing right and responsibility and privilege of everyone who is called on the name of Jesus and been born again. And not only that, it is the delight. It's not only the privilege and the right. It is the privilege. It is the right. It is the responsibility of every believer. But it's not only that. It's the delight. Because in prayer, 
new beauties are forever being unveiled. As we spend time with the Lord in prayer, we're constantly seeing more degrees of his splendor and goodness. Sometimes it just blows your mind as, and thank God it does, as, as he unveils new things. Even, uh, and you can change in that moment. Come on, church, can I get a witness? You can change in that moment in, before his face and in his presence in ways that you could not in any other way. You know, everybody can pray. Listen, I found this quote from Max Lucado, modern poet and author. He said, our prayers may be awkward. Our attempts may be feeble. But since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it, our prayers do make a difference. Let me read that to you again. Our prayers may be awkward. Our attempts may be feeble. But since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it, our prayers make a difference. The power of our prayers is in him who hears it. As Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty two, 22, have faith in God. And, and guys, that's easier to do when you know him. And the better you know him, the more well you know him, the easier having faith in him comes because he is trustworthy. You know, Jesus went on to say, therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, Believe that you receive it, and you'll have it. Amen. It's like in Matthew, he said, and whatever you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. What do you believe? You believe that God granted it to you, and it's on the way the moment your request made out and was, was made to God. Therefore, he said in verse 23, therefore I say to you, whoever says to this mountain that there's a problem in your life, be removed and be cast into the sea. And does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will come to pass. He'll have whatever he says. Why? Because by believing in your heart and saying so, commanding that mountain to move in your life. And here's a little editorial comment. A lot of people are talking about their mountain instead of talking to their mountain. And that's why their mountain stays right in front of them instead of getting out of the way. Because when you speak to that mountain in the name of Jesus... When you, with the faith in your heart, speak to that mountain and command it to move, the power of God goes forth in heaven and backs your words. Have faith in God is what I'm talking to you about. Though our prayers may be awkward, they may seem feeble, yet because the power in them is in those, the one who hears them, we know our prayers are effective. Now listen, we don't pray before because we're perfect Christians. You won't find in this room or any place else in the world a perfect Christian. I don't even hardly know what, what, what one would look like except to look at Jesus. Amen. We all fall short of that, don't we? Amen. Don't anybody raise their hand. But we, we don't pray because we're perfect Christians or, or we're spectacular at our spiritual disciplines. We pray because we are in need of supernatural strength supernatural help and wisdom and perseverance. Can I get an amen? We pray because we are in need. We pray because we are in need. We pray because we need to be spiritually sensitive. Spiritually sensitive. In Genesis 28, there's the account of a man named Jacob. Jacob was uh, Abraham's grandson. And Jacob had been told by his father to go into his homeland and get a wife. Excuse me. Uh. <laughs> uh, so he went out. He got tired. And on the way, he, he laid down to go to sleep at night. He was so tired, it says he grabbed a stone to use for a pillow. That always strikes me. You got to be really tired to use a rock for a pillow. <clears throat> Anybody ever have a pillow like that? And so, but he laid down when he was sleeping, he had a dream. And he saw a ladder uh, reaching from earth to heaven and angels ascending and descending on that ladder, taking people's requests to God and bringing provision to earth from God. And he woke up and this is what he said of that. He said, when Jacob awoke, this is verse 26, 
When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. Surely the Lord's in this place, and I didn't know it. I'm talking about the fact right here that we need to pray because we need to be spiritually sensitive. He was, man, God was in that place. Matter of fact, Jesus relating to this, we call this Jacob's ladder, by the way. And as children, we sang songs about it. We are climbing Jacob's ladder and, and that sort of thing. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But Jesus in John 1 51 refers back to this. And he says to Nathaniel, his disciple, uh, he told Nathaniel that I saw you under the tree. Dan, Nathaniel was just amazed because Jesus wasn't standing there. He was in another place. But by the Spirit, Jesus saw Nathanael while he was sitting under a fig tree. And Jesus went on to say back to him, he said, Most assuredly, I say to you, the time's coming when you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So what Jacob saw there, when he saw Jacob's ladder, when he saw that ladder, what he saw there was a picture, a vision of our relationship with God and how prayer and provision are going to work through the Lord Jesus Christ and what he does for us as we pray in his name. Our requests are going to reach heaven and God's provision is going to reach earth to us and through us, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to be spiritually aware, spiritually sensitive. Jacob, let me bring it back to that statement. Jacob said, God is in this place and I didn't know it. See, God is here. God is wherever you are. He's right there. But lots of times we don't feel it. We don't see it. The distractions, the cares, the worries, the problems, the thoughts, the activities, they, the natural things, they put a veil between us and the presence of God. But when we get into prayer, praise God, that veil gets opened up and we become aware of God's presence in our life. Amen. Aware of his provision. Aware of his victory. That's ours through Christ. Another account is in, in the book of, of 2 Kings chapter 6 where the prophet Elisha was being a problem for the enemy king. The enemy king was trying to destroy the people of God. And every time he would make a plan with his soldiers, God would speak that plan to Elisha the prophet. And Elisha would tell the king of Israel what the enemy was going to do. And the king of Israel would send his soldiers over there and help them be aware. And so all the plots of the enemy were foiled. And the enemy got so upset, he sent his army, sent people out to find Elisha. And they came back and said, he's in Dothan, the city of Dothan. And so he sent an army out to camp round about them. And in the morning, when Elisha's servant got up and went outside, he looked around and freaked out because there's soldiers all around. And he came back in and he was just terrified. And he said, told Elisha what was going on. And here was Elisha's response in verse 16 of 2 Kings 6. Elisha told him, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because there's more on our side than on theirs. Don't be afraid. There's more with us than there are with them. Don't be afraid. There are more on our side than there is on their side. Listen, we sing that, right? Don't we sing that? It may look like I'm surrounded, but what? I'm surrounded by you. I'm surrounded by him. And Elisha prayed. Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes and let him see. Open his eyes and let him see. What a beautiful example of prayer for somebody else. See, prayer is not only for you. Prayer is not only for me. When we pray, it's not just for our benefit. But Lord opened his eyes that he might see. And the Lord opened his eyes and he was able to see the, the, the forces of God all around them. That it wasn't doomsday. You know, Jesus prayed. It's recorded that he had a habit of, he was known to go out and pray all night at times. Why? So he could see what the Father was doing and do it. So he could hear what the Father was saying and speak it. So he could be ready to open blind eyes, to cast out devils, to open deaf ears, to, to make dumb mouths speak, to heal the, lime, the, the lame, to give recovery of sight to the blind, to bind up the brokenhearted, to cast out devils, 
So he could be ready when called upon at any moment. He spent time in prayer and in fasting so he could be ready. Now, every one of us, every one of us as believers is to know how to pray and to pray. Amen. Every one of us is to know how to pray and to pray. Now, I know in our area, there's a lot of people that have been taught that, that for instance, with the Bible, you don't need to read that. Well, to, matter of fact, we don't want you to read that thing. We understand it. We'll tell you what it says. You don't need to, you, We got that covered. You, we, got, we, we got that covered. You know, it's kind of like you see on TV sometimes as a professional, don't do this at home. You know, but the reality is, the truth is, nobody else can do your praying for you. Okay, they can pray for you, but they can't do your praying for you. Okay, so every one of you, every one of us needs to know how to pray. And every one of us needs to pray. Need to pray. See, let me say it again. Prayer is the amazing, right, responsibility and privilege of every person that's called on the name of Jesus and been saved. And it's not only that, it's a delight. It's a delight as God unveils beauties to us. Now listen, we're to be praying for and with one another. For and with one another. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, the Apostle Paul writes to the believers there, and he says, praying always with, with, for all the saints, all the believers. And then he adds this, and for me. Here's the great man of God who wrote three-fourths of the New Testament. A man that had been taken to heaven and saw glory so spectacular, he was not even permitted, permitted to speak of them. Such a glorious experience, he didn't know if he was in his body or out of his body. Being used of God to plant churches and, and minister miracles all over the place, and yet he said, pray for me. Pray for me that I have boldness to speak as I ought to speak. Boldness is a fearlessness, a cheerful courage to, to speak what I ought to speak, not be silenced, not be intimidated, not be shut up or backed down. But to speak like I ought to speak, like the agent, the ambassador of God, pray for me. Pray for me. I'm asking you, church, to pray for me. I want to speak what I ought to speak. Amen. Not be intimidated by man or beast. <laughs> but to say it. You all say, say it, pastor. <laughs> you know, well, pray for me. Why? Apparently, when you pray, things change. Amen. When you pray... It makes power available. Like we heard last week, it makes tremendous power available as we pray for one another, including your pastor. 2 Corinthians 1 says, and you are helping us by praying for us. By praying for one another. We're helping one another to accomplish God's plan in our lives. Amen. Let me say it again. By praying for your brother, by praying for your sister, by praying for them, you are helping them accomplish God's design for their life. You're helping them. Can I get a glory to God? See, in Acts chapter 4, verse 23, Peter and John were in prison. And in one place it says, in being let go, verse 23, they went to their own companions and reported everything that had been said unto them because they were ordered not to, they were ordered to back down and shut up. But being let go after being intimidated, where'd they go? They went to their church family. And it gives us a clue about what a character of a church family, a healthy church family is. It calls them companions. Not just fellow attenders of a service where they're sitting in rows and looking forward, but they were in relationship with each other. They cared about each other. Kind of like Eliza Doolittle said in My Fair Lady, kind of friendly like. They went to their own companions. And it says in verse 24, and what did they do? So when they heard their, that, they raised their voice to God with one accord. They, I'm talking to you about the fact that we 
Each of us need to know how to pray and to pray. And we need to pray. Each, we're to pray for each other and with each other. They lifted their voice to God with one accord. They were together. They were in harmony. They were in unity. They were one. They, that's a plural world word, they lifted their voice. That's a singular word. One voice, one mind, one vision, one heart, one purpose, one voice. Multiple people praying together. God, grant that your servants may speak with your word with boldness. And boy, God heard the prayer and shook the place. And they all spoke the word of God with boldness. Hallelujah, Jesus. In Acts chapter 12, Peter was kept in prison. It says, the, listen, the brother, the brother was in jail. And it says in verse, verse 5, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. The word prayer, you could add, unpack it a little bit. It says, but constantly, earnestly, prayer was made for him to God by the church. The man was in jail. But back home, in their homes, and in the church, in the temple, and from house to house, unceasing prayer was being made for him, and God got him out. Why? Because they cared enough, and they prayed, and God heard. I'm talking to you about that the, we need to know how to pray, and we, need, and we need to pray. Billy Graham said it this way. He said, to get nations back on their feet, we must first get down on our knees. Amen. Now listen, we all face crises in life. Would you look over to Second Chronicles 20 with me? There's the account of, of King Jehoshaphat. King Jehoshaphat had a bunch of things coming against him and the people that he was leading. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and let me just say this as, as, as we get ready to look at that. We all face crisis in life. And the dictionary, we all do. And the dictionary says that a crisis, it defines a crisis as an event that is going to, lead, going to or is expected to lead to an unstable and dangerous situation affecting an individual, a group, a community, or a whole society. We all face, every single one of us face crisis in life. It could be a time of intense difficulty or trouble or danger. Could be like that. For instance, you may be going along and some health issue hits you. That kind of hit me a number of weeks ago. A uh, kidney stone. I hadn't had one. Boom. Laid me low. I mean, thoughts like that come. You know, or maybe you've got a chronic situation. All of a sudden it flares up. Or, or you think it's just a little deal. And suddenly the doctor says it's, I mean, this could affect, could affect everything. You know, it, it's a crisis. It, 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 it may not. It's, it's a crisis. A health crisis. Or it could be, it could be a relational crisis. You know, maybe, maybe one of your children, depending on how old you are, maybe one of your children or, or your in-law children or outlaws, however you want to think about them. You know, they'd be going along straight, going in the wrong direction. All of a sudden, boom, they turn, turn sideways or they just do a 180, walk away from what's normal. Maybe, you know, some, in a relationship, it's a crisis. Or, or you wake up some morning and, and the person who loved you yesterday doesn't. Or it may be a professional crisis. Maybe, maybe the market shifted. Or maybe the, the industry that you're involved with has changed. I mean, what a day of transition that we're living in. Today, industries just change and they're no longer even relevant anymore. Or, or, or you know, the, the place where you work has experienced a merger and now your very position is threatened. You know, we all face crisis or maybe it's maybe it's a, a tornado came through or a flood has hit and and we're facing that or or it could be a time when simply a time when a difficult decision or an important decision needs to be made i mean there's some times in our life like that yes yeah where where we're looking at things and it's not like that roof fell in but we need to make a decision here 
And it's not an easy one. I mean, there are some easy ones. You know, whether I have grilled chicken or fried chicken on your sandwich, that's pretty simple. But there's some things in life that are just not that. They're not that simple. And that's a crisis. Or, or maybe, maybe you're at a time where we come to from time to time uh, where, you know, that, that it's, it's, not like the, it's not like the wheels are falling off the bus or, or the whole thing is falling apart. But you've come to the point where, where we're just stuck. And we're not moving forward like we want to. And so that's, that's why we titled what we're doing right now, Unstuck. Unstuck. Because God's called this church to go forward. Amen. And not only the church, but you as an individual. And the way we go forward, the power to go forward is through prayer. Yes. What should you do? What should we do when crisis comes our way? What should you do when crisis comes your way? You start with prayer. You start with prayer. It's like Corey Ten Boom. Some of you remember Corey Ten Boom, a, a, a pretty noted believer from a few decades ago. And some of you don't know her, but she was a prisoner of war. She, years after she got out of the prison camps of World War II, she came face to face with the man who had been her prison guard. And she had to come to a point of forgiving him. It was a beautiful story of God's mercy and love in her. But she said this, the prayer should be the steering wheel of your life, not the spare tire. Amen. You know, there's a lot of other things we could do, a lot of other actions we could take. But before we do any of them, the first thing we should do is pray. Can they get an amen, church? Amen. Now, in Second Chronicles chapter 20, they were facing a crisis. Five kings were coming against them, and the, and the king was afraid, but what did he do? He called the people of God together. He called them together, called the church, you could say, together to pray. And in Second Chronicles 20, he said, O Lord, O our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this multitude that's coming against us, nor, nor do we know what, let me paraphrase it, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Yes. We don't know what to do, but our, you know, it's, it's, as a leader, that's kind of scary. Stand up and tell the people, stand up and tell God in front of everybody, Lord, we don't know what to do. Well, they did the right thing. They put their eyes on God. I want you to notice verse 13. He said they were all there. Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives, their children stood before the Lord. They were all there. Listen, church, I haven't made a big point of this. And I probably made a mistake in not training you better over the years to do it. But can't go back. We can just go forward. I'm telling you, church needs to come together to pray. And when we have a prayer meeting, first Sunday prayer on Sunday night, first Sunday of the month, and when only 15 people show up out of 400 people in the church, something's sick and wrong. Amen. Preach it. A friend of ours, James Rushton, many of you know James. He's now has gone home to be the Lord, was a missionary for several years, and ministered in Indonesia, the most intensely Muslim country in the world, where there's an incredibly large and growing Christian church. There was one church there that has sister and daughter churches in other islands. And the pastor of that church called the pastors of those other churches and the believers, called them there to pray. And those people flew in to the main church and spent two days in praying and they all came. There's a church, folks, that knows the power of prayer. They knows the place of prayer, the necessity, the privilege of prayer. Come on, church. We need to pray. We need you to pray. We need you to pray, not just the prayer group, not just the prayer people, not just the prayer, the prayer superstars. We need every one of you when we have a prayer meeting to be here. And, to, and tonight we start with the 530 first Sunday prayer. And I do want while I'm thinking of it. Let me just say this. We're going to have child care. We heard your voice. Some folks couldn't come because they had little kids and didn't know have any place for the kids. So we're going to have a place for the kids. We want you here in church. You ought to be here. 
You ought to be here. Prayer is where it starts. Prayer is the power plan of the church, and God's called you to go forward as a church. And it starts with prayer before we do anything else. It starts with prayer because it's in prayer where you hear the voice of God. And right here in 2 Chronicles 20, they were prayed and the spirit of God came upon, came upon uh, Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, one of the worship leaders and gave them direction from God and they obeyed and they went out and look at verse 22 when they began to sing and to praise the Lord set ambushes against the people that were coming against them and they were defeated they were defeated listen when they came together come on church when they came together and they prayed they heard from God so they could obey and when they obeyed God went to fight for them they didn't even have to lift a hand in the battle they just lifted their voice this is how I fight my battles how we sing and we praise glory to God because there's a table prepared for us in the presence of our enemies So we don't live in fear. We get our eyes open to what God's done for us and who we are in him and who he is in us. And we pray and he sends the answers. We don't sit there with our knees knocking, taking it. I'm telling you, the devil can dish out more than you can take. You're not called to take it. You're called to stick it to him. Called to come into praise and worship. Get your heart full and swing out over hell and spit in the devil's face. So to speak. Hallelujah. Don't spit in your neighbor's face. Your battle's not against them. We pray because we need to be spiritually sensitive. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, it's recorded where the prophet Nathan came in to speak to David. He was talking with King David. And David says, I'm going to build God a house. And Nathan said, go ahead and do whatever's in your heart. And Nathan turned and left the room. And as he going out of the room, God spoke to the prophet. said, I never told him to do that. Go back in there. Go back in there and tell him, I never told him to do that. And furthermore, I, I'm going to have his son build me a house. And not only that, tell him this, I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to build you, David, a dynasty. I'm going to establish your kingdom. And there will never fail to be someone sitting upon your throne, ruling and reigning forever in God's name. And that's why Jesus, the Son of God, is called the seed of David. And he sits upon the throne of David. Look with me at 2 Samuel 7. How do we pray? God has spoke. It pays to listen. Prayer starts with listening. In 2 Samuel 7, David heard what God has said. Man, there's such, I'm going to encourage you to read all of 2 Chronicles 20. Read all of 2 Samuel 7. Read all of Daniel 9 these weeks. And let God speak to your heart about prayer. But in 2 Samuel 7, David, David says in the course of the chapter, he says this to God, never in the history of mankind has anybody ever experienced what I've experienced from you. Never has anybody had God speak to them and say, I'm going to build you a house and someone's going to sit on your throne forevermore. But listen to David's response to the word that God said of him, because this could be an, is an example to you of how to respond to the word of the Lord that he speaks to you about your life. Sometimes it's so glorious. Sometimes it's so wonderful. Sometimes it's hard to believe. Sometimes you can't. How is that, how, how is that ever going to happen? Remember when Joe Morris was here, church, and we played the video several times, and he told us concerning hub and spokes about this church, about what he's going to do with this church. He said, you might be concerned about how am I ever going to pull that off? How am I ever going to make that happen? How am I going to ever do that? He says, you won't have to. I'm going to bring the components in. You're going to be able to sit there and simply watch all the components come together. Anybody remember that? And folks, in humility, this is what David said about what God spoke to him. Verse 25, he says, And now, O Lord God, the word which you've spoken concerning your servant, concerning his house, establish it forever and do as you've said. Lord, that's what you've spoken. That's what you've spoken. The word that you've spoken about me, Lord. Lord, this is not my idea. This is your idea. Nobody's ever heard anybody speak to them and have God. Nobody's ever had God say to them what you've just said to me. But Lord, since you said it, your servant finds this grace in his heart to pray this prayer unto you, that which you've spoken, 
Establish it and do as you've said. And let your name be glorified. See, it's not about us, church. It's not about you. It's not about me. When we pray, I'm telling you, what God is saying about this church and about you and your part in what God is up to around here is bigger than any of us. It's longer lasting than any of us. It reaches far beyond us. But it certainly does involve us. God's calling us to pray. Amen. God's calling us to pray. You could almost say of, of Jacob, Jacob, wake up! He was laying there asleep and God was in the place. And he didn't even know it. He was not aware of it. Wake up! And in some ways, this is a wake up call. Today. For us to start to pray. People's lives are dependent on it. I'm telling you, the, the, the wheels are not falling off the bus. It's not like everything around here is falling apart. You know, I want you to understand that. You know, because I, I was just thinking, you know, mindful of that. You get ready to deliver a word like this, man, people, are well, they going to think I better say this right? Are people going to think we're going to hell in a handbasket, you know, like the church? No, we're not falling apart. You know, the wheels are not falling off the bus. No. But we've got places to go, things to do. Amen. Together. Yeah. together. And we need to go together. And we'll only get there together. Amen. Come on. Man, there's people, there's people, so I hate to use the word hell so much. There's people, so I are a mess. People being ravaged by sickness, chronic things going on and on and on. People's relationships, their finances. I mean, so what? It's in the world, but it's not supposed to be here. I care about you. I care about them too. But we can do something. Yeah. We can do something for, for people. It starts in prayer. Not by the one hired to pray praying. But by all of us praying. Can I get an amen? amen. In Daniel chapter 9. It, said it starts with listening. It starts with listening to God. And in Daniel chapter 9 verse 1. Daniel was reading the word of God from the prophet Jeremiah. The, Daniel and his, and his uh, people had been taken into captivity, carried off into Babylon. And as they went there, God was speaking at that time through Jeremiah the prophet saying, you're going to be there 70 years. Well, now it's 70 years later, and Daniel is reading in the prophet Jeremiah, and he's, it stands out to him from the Lord that... 70 years has been accomplished, and it's come in time. So what does he do? Daniel chapter 9, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and, re and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. And he went on and he began to pray. And let's notice some things out of this. And let's notice that Back down in verse 20, it says, While I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man, that's the angel Gabriel, whom I have seen in the vision in the beginning. Let me skip down to verse 22. He talked with me. God sent an angel and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Notice verse 23. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out. And I've come to tell you. What's he saying? He's saying, Daniel, he said, I'm an angel of God. I've got a word from you about what you've been talking about. And I want you to know your prayer was heard the first time you sat down to pray and seek God. And I fought that. It took 21 days for me to get here. And I had to fight through the opposition spiritually to get here. But we want you to know, heaven wants you to know, yeah. wants you to have wisdom that your prayer was heard and your answer is on the way and you got the victory. Yes, hallelujah. 
Heaven wants you to know that you've got the victory. Glory be to God. See, there's time sometimes between the amen and the there it is. But heaven wants you to know that when we pray, God's going to give it to us. We're going to believe what we receive, that we receive, and we're going to see it. And it's not just all about us, but the lives of the people in Platteville, the lives of the people that are out there. We're, we're, it's, and it's about your lives. Listen. I made the state. I, did I say this in this service? I'm going to say it. If I said it before, I'll just you hear it twice. I made a mistake a while back of saying we're not the same church we used to be. That was simply my way. Of, let me try to say it a better way. We are the same church we've always been. We're still Word of Life Church. We're the same church we've always been. We've just got a new assignment from God. But we're the same love-filled, grace-filled, word-filled, Holy Ghost-filled, relational church we always have been. And we're not going to change that. And you need to understand that as your pastor, I'm not reaching out to somebody else and forgetting about you. And we're not reaching out to somebody else and forgetting about each other. But neither are we going to let ourselves be closed in and introvert and not care about anybody out there because we're so important. Are you with me? We're going to pray. And we're going to, so here's what I want us to do. Here's one of us, in your seat backs, you've got some cards. I want you to grab them. You can look like this. Got a big green circle on it with a 21. And to help one another out, there should be enough in the sanctuary for everybody to get one. I want everybody to have one. Okay, go ahead and God said, if you don't have one, raise your hand and somebody around and get one to them. Okay, everybody get one of these. Adults, young, younger adults, everybody in here, get one of these. 21 days, and here's what I want you to do. Before you fill them out, I want you to listen to me. Before you fill them out, here's what I want you to do. But I want you to know something. That these, are, these are for you. These are not, these are not, you're not going to turn these in. These are for you to take home. They're a reminder for you. But what I'm going to ask you to do is every one of us to mark on one of these cards how many minutes a day you will pray. God is calling us and I'm calling the church right now just like Jehoshaphat did. How many, does this resonate with anybody? Anybody, we need to pray. Okay, so here's what I'm doing. Let me tell you, let me say it again. You are not going to turn these in. Okay, the pastor's not going to see this. <laughs> so uh, this is a reminder for you to take home and put wherever you put reminders. You know, we used to put them up on the refrigerator. If that's where you put reminders, put it someplace so you can see it, bathroom mirror or something. Or now that we have smartphones, put a reminder on your phone, you know. And, and also during the week, we're going to be sending out reminders. Now, we're not going to be dogging you. Okay, we're not going to say, did you pray your 10 minutes? You know, we're not going to be dogging you. We're just going to be sending out, remember to pray today. Or have you prayed today? Just something to help you, you know. And we're going to be sending out things sometimes during these next three weeks, these next 21 days, we'll be sending out certain topics for us all to be praying about on certain days. So we can be unified. We can be in one direction. Anybody know? Can, can I get an amen? Somebody know? So, so we can be together in this thing. I want you to write everybody. Everybody take one of these and write on there how many minutes a day you're going to pray. Now, Listen to me. I may be totally frank with you. This is not a religious thing. This pastor's not going to see it. So just be honest. Please, please, please. Just be honest. I would much rather you put five minutes and do it than you put 60 minutes and fail and get all under condemnation and then try to put on a happy face like you're trying to please pastor. Pastor, nobody else is going to see these things. Are you with me so far? But we need to pray. And so now... Be truthful and honest about it. And then, but here's what I do want you to do. On your connection card that we're going to turn in at the offering time, I want you to put on your connection card how many minutes you're going to pray. Now, here's why. Again, we're not going to dog you, but here's why. Totally, you know, full disclosure. In the future, when we do something like this, I would like to be able to see at that time whether we've improved in our participation from this time whether we've grown in prayer, whether more people are involved in prayer, whether we're praying more, we're more sensitive to things. 
I'd like to be able to do that in the future to see if we've improved. And the only way I'm going to be able to see if we've improved is to have a record of how we're doing today. Does that make sense? So that's the only reason why I'd like to know how many people are praying and how much time we're praying. So I want you to put that on your connection card. But nobody's going to dog you. Nobody is going to to be after you about praying. Hallelujah, Jesus. We want you to put on your connection cards so that we can be encouraged by how many people are praying. Glory to God. Finally, Psalm 27, verse 8 says this. My heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I'm coming. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for the call you have on this house to be a house of prayer. And I thank you for taking us forward. Father, just the same way that we see in the word of God, people turn their turn to you with prayer and fasting and emotion and reality and perseverance, truth and results. Same way they came to you and authentic authentically and you met them with mercy and revelation and glory and your power was made known. Father, we commit today and choose today. We hear your voice. You're calling our hearts. And we say today, we're coming. Let each person say, I'm coming. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here this morning, you don't know if you're a child of God. You don't, you've, You've heard about church. This may be your first time ever in a church. In the beginning, God made mankind to walk in fellowship with him. But mankind disobeyed God and was separated from the one that loves him. And Jesus came and took care of everything by his death and his resurrection so that people could come back into a fellowship with God as his children. Whoever calls on the name of Jesus, whoever trusts him, as their savior, becomes the beneficiary of all those things that he provided. And you can do that this morning. I grew up in church, but I found out that growing up in church doesn't make you a child of God. But if you trust Jesus and believe what he did, you change on the inside. God becomes your father. And you enter into that great, big, wonderful plan that he's got for you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you would say, Pastor, I believe what you're saying about Jesus. I don't know that I've ever received him, but I want to. I want to know that I'm a child of God starting right now. I'd like to pray with you. We're not going to ask you to come forward. We're all going to pray together. But I'd like to to pray with you and help bring you into that relationship with the Lord. So if you do this for me, we'll pray. If you're on the count of three, just go ahead and raise your hand. And then we'll pray. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's all pray together. Just say it with me. Dear God in heaven, thank you for what you did for me through your son Jesus. Right now, I receive him as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my life making me new and helping me live for you. In your name I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's the best action you could ever take. Hello and thank you for joining us this week. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, I'd like you to prayerfully consider partnering with us financially so we can get the word of God to more and more people. We really do pray that this ministry has been a blessing to you. And if you're in this area, next Sunday at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock, come on out and join us. If you're not here in the area, then please join us again online next Sunday. Thank you again and God bless you.